long day. I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowd. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by 10 Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me Hello there. Good morning. So most people probably don't realize that during the course of a given week, I think about things and put them in the back of my head and say, I got to talk to Father Kath about that. Do you do the same thing? I do, especially now that we're doing these podcasts, because I think to myself, I'm going to have an opportunity to discuss something. But it, unfortunately, my card catalog, the back of my head, has massive holes in the bottom of it. So I put a card in there and it falls <laughs> right to the floor somewhere. It's hard to remember yeah. the things I want to talk about. Well, that's like, I mean, I can barely remember one thing to the next. But, you know, the, the reality is, you know, the types of th- so the types of things that make it into my little card catalog for you, they're not trivial. You know, they really aren't. They're, they're, they're meaningful. They're, they're substantial. Um, it may seem like uh, it was triggered by a, a trivial thought or a trivial consideration, but the reality is there's a lot there to unpack. And so, you know, one of the things I think that we try to do in our conversations is to bring that light of faith and what we know by virtue of our faith, uh, as well as uh, philosophical underpinnings, mm. and apply them and to do it in such a way that we we learn more. Mm-hmm. And we and we gain more. So for me, I want to check in with you because I'm seeing something or I don't understand something. And I know that you have the philosophical and theological underpinnings. I know that I have a certain philosophical, theological underpinnings that we can draw upon right. and to see, you know, with, with a greater light. So although sometimes it may seem like we're talking about what others may refer to as trivialities, the reality is, I mean, we are trying to learn from everyday experience, uh, from the things right in front of us, and not merely the abstract. Right. Look at life and yeah. begin to comment on it, a subsurface, as it were. And the fact is, is almost everything that's worth looking at, and most things in the world, of course, are, are worth, therefore, considering. It's interesting that the the word speculative life, right, or contemplative life, that word speculative means um, to see something as in a mirror. Because when St. Paul says, of course, that in the future, we're going to see God as he is. Right now, we see him as it were in a mirror. And that kind of um, shadowy reflection, the way in which, of course, ancient mirrors weren't as perfect as the ones we have now are. And you don't see things as clearly as you would with the naked eye. And so part of our attempts and tasks here with you is to look at something acutely. And to learn. And to learn. And to learn from it. And I I know that it's, you know, for, for the average rank and file person, it can be difficult, right? You have a lot of tasks. You have a lot of obligations, uh, whether you have uh, employment or whether you're working at home um, directly with your family and your children. There's a, a thousand things on your mind to mm. take care of. But we do have time to think. Absolutely. And that's this is part of the difficulty of the unexamined life, as Socrates would say, right? That that most of the knowledge that we attempt to gain and to glean has to do with doing things or making things, right? What St. Thomas would call it the, the, the arts, as opposed to so that's practical intellect, as opposed to the speculative. That we do have time to think. And it's the best part of us in the sense that that to take something in from the outside world and begin to turn it around, to consider it, et cetera. So that's what we're trying to do. It's the only way you can evolve. Yeah. It's, it really is the only way you can evolve uh, in your own formation, your own education, your mm. own understanding. And so, so, all right, I'll tell you one of those little cards I put in the back of my mind uh, recently, which is derived from a few experiences I've had recently, mainly encountering unpleasant people. 
um, or people who were caught in an unpleasant mood and I had to interact with them. Unpleasant people. Un- so I don't want to, right, I'm going to say unpleasant people as a shorthand because mm-hmm. it's just easier to say. Right. I recognize that they are not ontologically unpleasant people. They are not on their level of their being unpleasant. It's a bad moment they were in. Right. It's transient. I get that. I'm sh- I know for a fact I can be unpleasant too. So I'm just going to say unpleasant people understanding the fact that it's like weather, right? It moves through all of us. But there seem to be some people who like that weather. Mm. <laughs> they, they, they live in the uh, the cloud of unpleasantness. And when you interact with them, <laughs> uh, you know, your sunny day just, just got a dose of rain. Um, and, and so I, I've been conscientious of it in large part. It's a bit of a confession. Uh, I had an interaction with someone where um, I was tired and just kind of off my game. And this this individual um, received me with a great deal of unpleasantness mm. and I thought disrespect. And my reaction immediately, reflexively, was to match her. Mm. You know, it was to reply in kind. Mm-hmm. And I found myself going from zero to 60 in tension. Mm. And contending with this person by engaging them in the way that they uh, she had engaged me and it just kind of escalated and um it was not a, i was not it's not a proud moment in fact i went back and apologized because um my conscience bothered me but that said as i reflected upon it it, it you know, what what happened there and i was sucked in to the unpleasantness i was not rooted in my own disposition. I was kind of off guard. And the moment I encountered her orbit, it was like I was pulled into her vacuum of unpleasantness. And it was really difficult to escape. <laughs> so, you know, I know, you know, as a moral theologian, all sorts of things, you probably have a hundred things you can say on the matter. But it ma- just on the, on the, yeah. on the, on the um, superficial level, it matters to me that people try to engage respectfully and pleasantly. It does not mean you can't be an inherent pessimist. You can't, it does not mean that you have to be a bubbly, sanguine personality. It just means you need to be respectful of another person. It used to be called um, uh, <laughs> just being polite, right? Right. Um, or as they say, Italians have a great way of saying um, that someone is disagreeable by some, that they're maleducato. Right, that they're literally poorly educated, because there's Spanish. It's, it's true, yes. Yeah, like bad manners. Because there's there's something about the the interactions we have with human persons that demand the same kind of respect that we would show to our friends, and so we can't be friends with everyone, right? Obviously, there are very few friends in the course of a lifetime. Uh, any any meaningful friendships, even though you have all sorts of pleasurable and useful friendships, etc. But the, the way in which one gets trained to treat the person that you meet at the grocery store, at the post office, um, or anywhere else for that matter, is extending to them the kind of way in which you would treat one with whom you are friends. The, the person that, that I always think of, and I have the most interesting sort of success with in this level, is, is traveling. There's no one that receives more, as it were, cloud of unpleasantness than the the person who works at the ticket office delivering bad airport, news a lot, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, everyone hates them, right? Because they're stressed out. Everyone walks. If you've ever watched people at an airport, they walk really quickly, as if everyone's going to be late, as if the entire system of airplane travel is up for grabs all of a sudden, and and so people are tense in in those sorts of situations, and and the poor person who has absolutely no control over the airline is just sitting there taking your bags, is the person that receives massive clouds of unpleasantness all the time. And the reason I bring it up is because your your statement made me realize that how many times I've approached that ticket counter with perhaps a bit of anxiety or demands or things of that nature that I wanted to get across. And I've every time I've checked myself and try to break through what they have, they have... um, 
incubated by virtue of everyone else's difficult uh, situation that by by noon they're all upset too mm -hmm. because they've, they've entered into that cloud as you put it mm -hmm. and to try to bring a little bit of sunshine there it's amazing when they finally break and they're like oh my gosh you're not going to treat me poorly yeah <laughs> you're not going to make my life even more miserable even though i have no idea who you are well it's funny that you mentioned the, the traveling because recently i traveled and uh, I, I was thinking about this. That other incident happened before I traveled, and it kind of got under, you know, it kind of got under, I'm not saying under my skin, but it got in my mind. Like, how do I avoid that again, right? I don't want to do that again, even should somebody foist a dark cloud in mm. my direction. I don't want to engage. So I've developed a principle, mm. actually, two. One, underreact. So as a way forward, I'm going to choose an underreaction rather than an overreaction, hmm. which will, I think, incline me toward being a bit more dignified and generous hmm. uh, because I don't want to match the energy that's being thrown right, at me. Right, 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 um, which is the temptation. So for me, I, uh, yeah, when I say underreact, I mean underreact to the negative energy that's coming at me. Go underneath it. Don't try to equal it. And certainly don't try to pounce back harder. Um, and then the other is I have concluded after 50 some years of life that <laughs> I generally don't like people who don't try to be pleasant. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I don't know how else to say that, but um, to me, it's, it's a sign of the, of respecting the inherent dignity of another person. And, and people can be pulled, you know, they, they can feel justified by being unpleasant or in their unpleasantness. They can think, well, because so-and-so is wrong, then therefore I can be decidedly unpleasant. Mm. That it's somehow uh, a due response, um, and and I, I sometimes I find I find this. I mean, no offense, because I know you belong to this community of cholerics. I do. Uh, I can find among cholerics that they. I was just going to admit it, but now well, you're calling me out. Well, you're you being know, very unpleasant. Well, I, <laughs> no, I said it very pleasantly. Actually, the, the, the listeners will know how politely I said that. So for those who don't know about choleric the, the tendencies or the, the temperaments, I mean, do you want to offer a brief explanation? The, the medievals believed that there were four different kinds of temperaments and they were based upon different kind of humors in the blood. And whereas they might be incorrect or inaccurate relative to the cause of it, they are quite accurate relative to the kinds of persons that there are. Most people fall into... Um, a predominant temperament and then it's sort of a secondary temperament. And so the, the names for them were relative to the humors in the blood, as I mentioned. So a sanguine person is someone, as Father said, is very bubbly and, and optimistic. optimistic and uh, kind of the life of the party, but not always a deep Precarious thinker. often. Um, we would call them now a bit more of an extrovert and right? they can recharge by being with people, et cetera. And you need all these kinds of people around. Each temperament has its own good and its own uh, difficulty. So the sanguine, um, there is the phlegmatic, which is that slow moving river, that, that languid river. They never get too worked up about anything and are not usually the persons that give you initiative, but they're also the persons that can roll with the punches. Um, the melancholic, which literally means sort of black bile, um, is the person who can oftentimes a very deep thinker, um, but can be corrosive in their thinking because they brood on things. They think um, about situations that happen to them externally and they take it inside and don't react. Whereas the choleric reacts immediately. Um, the choleric is usually the guy that walks around with his, his podium and sets it up and begins to preach to everyone because he has a strong, really strong sense of justice. And when he has a disordered self-love, everyone who doesn't have the same love that he has for himself is therefore unjust. And so they <laughs> receive from him a, a massive amount of rancor and anger mm -hmm. because they're not following in line. It can, it, it, that, that undue, um, well, uh, the undue self-love yeah. uh, in the form of a choleric looks like a finger wagger. It does. Somebody who just it does. It's walks a around wagger. wagging a finger. Yep. And we, we all know them. We love, I mean, for first, first of all, my father shares in the community of choleric mm. as you do, mm. um, as well as uh, a lot of my friends, actually, mm. in, the, in the clergy. It's true. It's true. I'm surrounded by choleric. You are concerned. Well, we have a few notable exceptions, but cholerics get things done. 
but they can also um, create a lot of damage. And so while they tend some to be good teachers, they tend to be good teachers, but they can, uh, the, the image I, I have for myself and one of the things that I've attempted to work on is that it's true. I can plow through a field and get to the end of whatever needs to happen. But then I look back and I see all these sort of um, damaged uh, fields that I that I went through. There's a lot of collateral damage mm. oftentimes with the collar. He gets to the end that he's seeking, but other people and persons and certainly their feelings are oftentimes are just collateral damage. So, all right. So, so we've, since we've entered into the, the realm of the medieval temperaments, so when you look at a sanguine person, they're, they're very unlikely to be unpleasant. No. Uh, they're, they're just not going to be that way. I mean, that's not how they're disposed. Um, then if we were to look at the phlegmatic, now the phlegmatic could be unpleasant if they don't want to be bothered. Right. So uh, if, if the, they usually roll with a punch as well. But if you force them to have to manage something that they find bothers him, that would be an irritant that could be. Yeah, it's a, it, probably not in the way you're you're using unpleasant. You probably ran into a choleric. Um, <laughs> right? it's, it's unpleasant in so far as the person manifests their certain indifference to something that you're excited about or something. But it's not unpleasant in that sort of abrasive, like, I can't, what, what, what energy am I picking up on here? Right. Um, well, I guess the bottom line is that there are different temperaments mm. and different temperaments are going to suffer from mm. the temptation to project unpleasantness. Yes. More than others, right? Yes, yes, to be sure. To be I, fair enough. I think the color is, is, is certainly the most unpleasant. <laughs> <temperament>. <laughs> if they don't keep it in check. Um you know, although I do keep my father in check very well, you know. Oh. I, well, let's let's just, me let's let's go ahead and then sort of define what we mean by unpleasantness, because there's a certain amount of desire that is natural and good to want to be pleasing to someone, right? I mean, everyone enjoys the fact that when they're growing up, you know, their parents put their coloring page up on the refrigerator. Or you got a good job from a teacher or a coach, et cetera. We, we do look to the, the, the larger community to realize whether or not we are actually acting well. And so part of the response we get from other persons is just that. Right? It's good that you exist. Right? It's good that you are. You have done well, if you have. Um, and yet we're extending that sort of courtesy to persons that we don't know when we're just being pleasant. Um, and maybe, maybe there's another aspect to this that you want to tease out relative to a sort of definition, but I, I think about the nature of the word grace itself, right? And St. Thomas, when he talks about grace, says that giving a nominal definition, meaning a, a definition that just has to do with where the name was derived, um, it means to be in someone's favor, right? to, to be pleasing to someone literally, right? So that when God looks at us is he pleased with us what's different than the way in which i might be pleased with you or you might be pleased with me his his look actually makes us pleasing so it's the it's the gift that makes the other person pleasing and so it's it's a power it's a, it's a capacity but prescinding from that the same sort of thing happens with us on a, on a different level it doesn't give us the power to be good but it, it does help like when someone, when we encounter someone and they're affable and they smile at us, we are encouraged, literally, mm. to be able to do something well. Um, and I, I think that what we're what we're getting at is when someone is unpleasant, they're saying to us immediately that we are not in their favor, and it, it feels as a diminishment of our own. It's a message. Being. It's a message. It's a message. That I don't yeah. want. It's not good that you are here. It's yeah. not good that you exist. Whether you intend it or not. Whether you intend it or not. It's there is something being communicated. And the message is being received. There's no doubt about it. Mm. You know, um, as you were talking, I had like five things go off, <laughs> and now I'm gonna see like, what did those cards just drop in my my head? Yeah. Um, because you just to give an example. I mean, you are sort of sanguine, melancholic, which is the most impossible temperament to have together. Um, but typically you, you are very, um, pleasant with people. You don't necessarily, you don't easily get roused. Um, and when you do, um, I know that it's something significant because you just, it's just not your go-to. Whereas if you see me get roused, it's like, okay, Cal will be over it in 30 seconds. Let's hope he doesn't blow something up in the meantime. <laughs> um, 
but it's 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 so, true. So you you feel I, I go, it. I go uh, hundred degrees, hundred eighty degrees out of character. Yeah. If I if I get roused and it can be striking, um, it, you know, it certainly can be striking because it's not my normal. Yeah, yeah. It's it, people don't expect it, um, and I, you know, I I try to I try to keep that in mind. But you know, I think that people uh, interacting with other people out there on the road or in the grocery store or at work or in their neighborhoods, if we were a bit more conscientious about the messages that we're sending relative to being pleasant or unpleasant. I mean, it's one thing to be pensive and not sure, engaged. Sure, sure, sure. You're just, everyone knows you're just somewhere else. But when we are entering into situations that are, are, are interacting with others, I think I think we should be a bit more conscientious about just being pleasant enough yes. uh, as, as affording a certain respect to the other. You know, I remember hearing... Um, story when I was in grad school I had a TA I, I was a, a TA and I had some students uh, who tell me about a trip they made up to New York City mm. <laughs> <laughs> and they were southern there yeah New York is unpleasant by by <laughs> this goes back to the, the social conditioning of defining what's pleasant right. and unpleasant so so they so they go up to New York City and they they were southern with a southern accent and a southern style and I must say that in the South, uh, there is uh, among that, that, that Southern hospitality, mm. a regard for pleasantness. But of course, you can run into people who don't have Southern hospitality. But for those it's that because they're do, here from New York, <laughs> <laughs> for those who do have that 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 marvelous tradition of Southern hospitality. Well, they went up and drove up to New York City to go see a concert. And as they approached one of the tolls at the base of the bridge, which, by the way, is always chaos. They proceeded to ask the toll man, big mistake, how to get to the concert center, which was at the garden, you know, something garden, whatever that thing is. Um, and, and the guy looked at them like they had 18 heads. <laughs> and he said to them, I kid you not, what do I look like? A uh, beep, 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 tour guide. <laughs> and they were stunned. And of course, they moved right through. Right. And when they came back and told me the story, I started laughing. I said, of course. I mean, I would have expected, quite honestly, nothing less than that reaction. Yes, yes. I said, because you don't understand the social condition there. You're being rude by holding everyone else behind you up. Mm. And you're asking this guy to give you directions when it's not the right time or place. And it's a complete uh, disruption in the system. And in New York, you don't disrupt the system. Mm. Uh, yeah, the colorful response uh, was, I think, undue. You know, a certain New York grit and charm, I suppose. Um, but uh, it's like going to the zoo and seeing animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 that said, that kind of reminded me when you were saying something about the cultural conditioning right. of what's considered to be pleasant or unpleasant. There are different circumstances and there are different cultures where they're going to project different values. And one of them in New York certainly is don't interrupt me. Like don't sure. don't impede my flow. Um, like if you're, you know, just standing when everyone is walking in this pathway and everyone knows you walk in this pathway and you're standing there because you don't know that they're going to feel like you're offending them mm. and they will meet, they will meet your, what they regard as unpleasantness and reply, reply in an unpleasant way, like with colorful language. Right. Right. Like get the heck out of my way. Well, you used a term, you know, as you know, we work in seminary formation and, and you used a term once with the men that is kind of stuck and that is social lubrication, which I think is a great term because not in every situation do you need to get down into the depths of someone's soul, right? When when you're meeting people and you're going through the checkout line, et cetera, and they say to you obligatorily, um, did you find everything you need? It's really not the time to say, as a matter of fact, no. And go through that right there. Or that's none of your or business. Or that's none of your business. <laughs> or, or when they say, are you having a good day? Or hello, how are you? It's true that you, we don't expect an answer from those things. But sometimes I actually get one. 
If you attempt to have just a, a moment of encounter with someone to say, you're not a cog and I'm going to treat you as a person and you just remind yourself of that before you get to, into an encounter and they may not respond, but I have had more often than not, someone just sort of pauses and looks at me and they'll just give me a, a real response. And I had one yesterday, which was very simple. It was like, How, how's your day going? And it was a checkout at the grocery store. And she just said, well, so far, so good. But I have to say, I just got on. And here's what I'm looking forward to later on. And it was a small thing. Right. And then we, we got into a couple more sentences worth of, worth of text uh, and context about our days, whatever else. And then we moved on. Um, a small thing, but it was an actual encounter that was pleasant, that was good, that made her life not be mechanical. And mm -hmm. especially now that we're taking over as many jobs as we can with machines as opposed to persons, um, to make them have an encounter, I think is a fantastic thing. Of course, it's different for me too as a priest, right? Because I'm dressed in a collar. It's a little more People inviting. expect it. Uh, it's inviting. Of and, a reaction be, of any sort. You're going to be creepy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get a reaction. Um, but I, I find those, those little vignettes and moments in life to be... Um, making something that I have to do that's a seriously menial, silly task of getting the groceries again, um, I find it to be life. It's, it's part of life mm. and encountering people. Um, and it matters. As, as Lewis, C.S. Lewis once said, you, you never meet an ordinary person. It's one of those great quotes that he has. You meet someone whose eternal destiny is such that should you see them in their glorified state, you'd be tempted to worship them. Mm. Or you see someone who will be an everlasting horror. And whatever you do in that moment encounter that you'll probably never have again with that person, that's the only time you get to see that person in, in your entire existence on this earth. Um, to which end did you assist them? It's a good way to put it. So, so, I, so let's recap. I had that last part for Lewis. So okay, I, he, he, was, he didn't say the last part. I was, I was glossing. Well, I affirm you <laughs> in, in your gloss. So let's recap. One, we both agree that people have a certain obligation, if, if not out of justice, but at least in charity, to project some respect for the dignity of others in what we're calling a modicum of pleasantness in interaction. We're both agreeing that should you walk into some, someone else's unpleasantness, that we would recommend mm. not matching it not matching. or exceeding it. I mean, obviously exceeding it, you enter into the realm of a sin against justice. It's an undue, you know, it's an undue response. Um, even trying to match it, though, uh, usually just escalates. It doesn't, you don't really ever just match and stay there. Right. You right. escalate. Yeah. And now I think uh, it leads people down a bad path. I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there. Oh, I, I'm the DEF CON 5 guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so my, my general advice is to try to, to try to come in with an underreaction. So um, to, to in, some, in, in a certain sense, it would t it'll, it, I think it'll put them off their footing. Sure. Uh, take them off their, you know, off their, their, their unpleasantness for a moment. Uh, because I, they, I would imagine that most of their responses are going to be met with unpleasantness right. or doubling down and coming back harder. Absolutely. And one of the sort of images I use with the guys is, is a very simple one, but it helps me, which is that every time I encounter, encounter someone, right, they're on their own little emotional roller coaster. Now, some people don't have super high highs and lows and twisty you know, corkscrew roller coasters, but some do. Mm -hmm. And my only point is that I, I have not bought a ticket to ride your roller coaster. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So I will, I'm happy to engage you, happy to be pleasant, but I'm not getting on the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. They kind of want to get you in there. That's why you go, you escalate. Exactly. It draws you in. And so that I think we would all admit that we can have bad days. Um, and be Well, you can. I mean, <laughs> since I'm so, colored, I can't believe that. When you encounter somebody being unpleasant, <laughs> maybe uh, give them a little extra space. Because if you're not having a bad day, I guess it's really tough when both of you are having a bad day. But if if the person is having a bad, just assume they may be having a bad day. You have no idea what's going on in their life. You have no idea what's you know what's going on. So that underreaction uh, or even even more charitable reaction in reply might might be warranted out of out of charity for the other person. So that can help. I, I think 
I guess taking that view of it might help you not to match in kind the negativity mm. that's coming at you, right. right? By just saying, okay, maybe you're having a bad day, or maybe a lot of people have foisted on them uh, a lot of negative, a lot of negativity. Um, and then I would say that um, you know we both agree agree that there are general dispositions that can lend themselves more toward unpleasantness yeah. uh, than others. And those people who have those dispositions, like a choleric, have to be a bit more careful. I'm kind of wondering during this entire discussion, since we never prepare anything, I'm really wondering whether or not he encountered me and just changed the pronoun <laughs> to she. <laughs> well, you know, you won't know, will you? <laughs> We have a way of disguising No, but I mean, even getting back to the very first uh, moment of this discussion, coming full circle, we were talking about looking at things, taking a pausing for a minute and looking at life, bringing to bear faith in our life with God on particulars. And this is another example. You just you just mentioned that maybe this person is going through X, Y, or Z, or maybe stepping back and not escalating, not matching, but coming under. But to do that, you can't react like an animal. You can't have a, a you can't have a, a match pitch mm-hmm. with the person across from you in, in a sort of reflective manner, reflexive manner. You have to be, on the contrary, reflective, mm-hmm. and stop and say, "All right, I'm going to volitionally react as opposed to just simply emotionally react." Um, and that's that's an entirely that's different thing that requires an interior life. So you can see for, what we did is we took an ordinary situation, ordinary circumstances. We brought to bear philosophical, theological, even interesting medieval thoughts. Mm. And we uh, we picked it apart. We dissected it a bit. And we, you know, we kind of walked away, I think, having better for having had this conversation because it helps me to keep in the fore of my mind when I'm walking into somebody else's bad weather, for lack of a better expression, uh, to have a bit of a strategy going into it. Amen. That's so, so true. But, all right, so before, before we, go, we go, you're, you're, before we go. you're first one. All right, so here's the deal. Okay. I had no idea. One of the things I love about living in Italy um, is that they don't really believe in eating any kind of food at any given time, okay. right? They're still very much tied to the seasons and things that come about in that particular season. So I was learning about growing garlic recently, and, I, and a friend of mine was sort of showing me um, the wonders of growing garlic, but there's a two week period in which something comes out of a garlic called a scape. You ever heard of it? It's no. fantastic. It's well, a how does it come out? So the garlic comes out like an onion a, when those little things just come like out. an onion, right? So yeah. you have these massive um, leaves that come out of the, uh, the bulb that's in the ground, mm-hmm. as you would in any uh, vegetable like that. And for two weeks, you have this sen- central tendril that comes out of the middle. It's it's cylindrical and it's got this little bulbous top on it. And then it begins to curl around. And I would have thought this thing was just an odd looking appendage. But you pull those off and you make a pesto out of it. And it's unbelievable. No. You, you don't add a stitch of garlic because, of course, it's, it's growing out of the bulb. Right. And it's just, it just looks, so looks like... So you kind of use it like a chive. It looks like a chive. Yeah. But you mash it up as you would any, any pesto. But you don't add garlic. You simply add normal right things. In. It is under. How long does it take to get a, to get long enough ones? And how many? It only this whole process lasts two weeks. Right, it Tell comes out like wild, kind of like the onion. Yeah, and then when it's gone, when it when it's done past its prime, it begins to sort of uncurl and shrivel up and get get uh, crinkly, mm-hmm. and it's you can't use it anymore. So you have to use it. So. You fresh. only get two weeks. You can do this. No, wait, wait. You make your so, pesto. So, but you it can't. Unbelievable. You can't buy the. You can't that, buy escapes. That, that, you, but you can't buy the the garlic, head of garlic, and bring it home and let it sprout. But you can. So this is, the, honestly, I have I have um, about 50 heads of garlic now that are, are you trying to sprout? In, my, in my bed. But all I do, all you do is to you grow garlic your, is... You mean your garden bed. <laughs> garden bed. <laughs> I'm very fastidious. So it definitely wouldn't be my bed. Um, but you just take one... Um, speak you i forget the name what, what do you call it little garlic a clove you take a clove and you put it there that's it and that will that will produce a new head that, that's your entire process of growing garlic it's so easy that even yeah. i can do it um but it's a lot of fun and, but no wait, wait. so it's it's the part that comes out of the ground that you use or are you saying you just let it sit in your kitchen and let the thing sprout like an onion no no you 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 plant it 
right? About so six you inches plant it, deep, about six and then it will down, grow that. And it, it will grow the normal foliage that comes out as, as it were, and like that's a carrot the stuff you're or whatever. Using. Nope. No. That foliage is up there for a long time, and you have to keep watching, because out of the center of that foliage will sprout just one cylindrical tendril. Oh, just a scale. Oh, just one. Just one. And you, you harvest that. So if you've got 50 heads of garlic, you're going to get 50 scapes. Wow. And how many it. does it take for uh, one of these? Uh, it depends on how much you want to make. But I mean, I had, I had enough for, um, I would say, sufficient amounts of pesto out of that to make probably about six pounds of pasta. Well, how many um, scapes? 50. You had 50 scapes? I probably had about 42. Yeah. I let some others grow and then I was too late to get them afterwards. They already. Did you save some for me? I did. I ah, did. nice. It's, I have some. Fantastic. All right. Fantastic. All right. So b- before we go, I uh, got a, uh, a text the other day from my sister. So my sister and her family live up in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's a shout out right there. Yep. So they live up in Washington, D.C. So um, her husband was working, but she took the kids to the Nationals game. And so my nephew, who I can barely believe is 14 years old, um, was at the game and they panned the big camera over in the direction where they were seated. Well, somehow or another, they brought over him a Coke and a hat as a way to recognize him all on this big jumbotron. And so he proceeds to smile and ham it up with the camera. He drinks some of his soda and then pours it over his head. <laughs> so now this thing has been tweeted out by the Nationals team and is on, on their Instagram page. And the whole thing is going, and there's, there's like 80, like 80 to 90 or 100 comments on it already. There's like nearly 20,000 views. It's hysterical. And um, my, as my sister said, I have no idea why he thought to pour the soda over his head. I, I think I know the reason. You, you said that he's 14? Yeah. Yeah. We don't develop reason as men for. But, <laughs> <laughs> but look at me. He's hysterical. He's, he's you know, he's, he's all smiles. Oh, he's great. wearing his uh, Nats jersey. He's got his hat they just gave him, his coat they just gave him, and then he proceeds to part of us. Now, if it were my nieces, his younger sisters, all they'd have to do to get the same reaction and probably twice the amount of views would be to just to smile into the camera. That's true. Because they're adorable. Maybe that's the lesson here. The uh, the young boy, he has to make a fool of himself with a young girl. All she has to do is give it a little <laughs> twinkle and a smile that's and the true. whole world melts. And you melt. Uncle, uncle melts. Absolutely. Well, God bless you all. Have a great week. Great talking with you. Okay. Ciao. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests, and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com and remember for more great ways to deepen your faith check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com and we'll see you again next time from the rooftop rooftop